Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to start in earnest our description of Fourier analysis. And the goal is to get to both quantum mechanics as well as, you know, a somewhat rigorous proof of the prime number theorem. So the first thing is, you know, what is Fourier analysis? What are the inputs? And so in Taylor series, we use the functions 1x, x squared, and we try to expand an arbitrary function in terms of these. And you hopefully have seen some rigorous results sometime in your career about how well Taylor series approximate. So how many of you have seen rigorous estimates of how well Taylor series do? They keep assuring me when I don't do this in Calc 3 that you guys will get it later in your life. All right, so we will remedy that and you will see, if not how well Taylor series do, at least how well trigonometric series do and trigonometric sums. So for Fourier series, we use e to the 2 pi i and x. And these functions are so important, we give them a name. Okay, we call them e sub n of x. Okay, so the purpose of this is to just remind ourselves that we're exponentiating. If you want, if you want people sometimes draw like a vertical line over there to make it a slightly non-standard e, just so that you know it's a function and not Euler's constant, or a constant sub n, that this is a function. This is just for typographical purposes to a large extent, so you don't have to keep writing e to the 2 pi i nx. This is equal to cosine 2 pi nx plus i sine 2 pi nx. Now we've talked about the definition of e before, so e to the z is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of z to the n over n factorial, and it converges absolutely to all z and c. Now when we're doing Fourier analysis, we're really only going to take z to be a real number between 0 and 1. Well, if z is, I'm sorry, if z is only going to be a real number between 0 and 1, why does this still fit inside a you know, complex analysis course? Yeah, right. because I have an I here, I can justify <laughs> teaching you this, because it has a square root. Does anybody know another notation for the square root of minus 1? I. So there's I, there's minus I, there's another one. J. So who uses J? The electrical engineers. So the electrical engineers use J for the square root of minus 1 because they use I for current. So just in case you ever pick up an engineering book, you know, be aware of that. Okay? Uh, the engineers often have a lot of really good descriptions of what's going on, but the notation is a little bit different. All right, so this converges for all, and we know e to the z, e to the w, is e to the z plus w. So we proved that early in the semester. What was the key input in the proof? Anybody remember? When you tell us by total powers, and you use by the Yes, excellent. So, binomial theorem. Okay, so that was the key input for that. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to convince you why Fourier series are superior to Taylor series. One of the big reasons is orthogonality. So I am a Bostonian. For the most part, what do I hate? Ours, Yankees. Yankees, right. And by extension, New York City. Right, the home of the Yankees. Although I will say at least the Yankees play in their own state, unlike other New York teams. Okay. But as a Bostonian, I have to give New York City credit for one thing, where New York is far superior, or at least part of New York is far superior to Boston. Road design. I'm sorry, road design. Which part of New York has a much better road design than Boston? No, not all. <laughs> there's, a specific, there's a special part of New York that's very well done. Manhattan. Manhattan is well done. Manhattan is a beautiful grid system. You know, Boston. <laughs> you, know, you have roads going like this, so they flip as to which one is above the other. Uh, you have roads that are one way the wrong way, and they have like two in a row that are one way the same direction. New York is alternating. New York is much, much better for something like this. Oh, <laughs> Boston is a nightmare to navigate around, okay? And I, I do realize that this is being recorded. Okay. <laughs> when you think about this, what coordinate system do you think of? I'm sorry? Cartesian. Really two nice perpendicular things. 
This would be some kind of like generalized Gaussian coordinate system, okay? <laughs> this would be a nightmare, okay? It is much easier to use orthogonal coordinate systems. Could I use the following? Could I use those as my two directions? Yeah. If you give me a point here, I flow high enough to get to that point, and then I you know, add additionally however much horizontal component I need. I could easily do that. Okay? The difficulty, of course, is these directions are not perpendicular. And so it's much harder to decompose. If they were perpendicular, okay, if I'm at the point 3, 4, three of these, four, uh, three of these, four of those. So we have a huge uh, natural inclination to want to use perpendicular coordinate systems. So when I expand in terms of functions, I want to expand in terms of a set of perpendicular functions. Except mathematicians don't use the word perpendicular. And you've already seen we've redefined the word differentiable in this class to be... No. Nope. Holomorphic. And then as a consequence, holomorphic implies inward. But we say holomorphic for differentiable. What do mathematicians say for perpendicular? Orthogonal. Right? I'm sorry? Um, you sometimes say normal, no, like a normal direction would be a perpendicular direction, and we do talk about orthonormal systems of vectors. So orthonormal is orthogonal of n unit length. And so we're going to actually construct an orthonormal, not just an orthogonal. Now, in linear algebra, how do you tell if two vectors are perpendicular? Take the dot product. Okay, and if the dot product is zero. So we need to find what is the analog of a dot product for functions. How many of you have seen the dot product for functions? How many of you have not seen the dot product for functions? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to quickly motivate the dot <laughs> product for functions. Sorry? Physics net divide. Uh, very apparent there. We did it in the previous class. Okay. For E&M for math. Okay. Excellent. And for today. Okay. Did they motivate where it came from? We did it in 210 and proved it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, did you, but did you see where the note... Where, why we define the dark product as an integral? Have you ever seen that motivated? No. They're, they're physics class. <laughs> Not math class. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the other word for dark product? In a. Alright. So I'm going to imagine I have you know functions of a real variable, say on a real line, and I'll modify it a little bit later. And of course, all functions live on the interval 0, 1. I mean, where else could they live? Right. So if I want to approximate a function with a vector, how might I do that? Like, maybe like, you want some kind of thing gradually different. Okay. That's kind of like... So, maybe, you know, chop this up into a bunch of pieces. And in each one of these, you know, I'll have you know, the value of my function. Yeah. And so if this is my function f, f corresponds to the vector f of 0, f of 1 over n, f of 2 over n, dot to dot, f of n minus 1 over n. Yeah. And it's just technically convenient to stop and not have f of n over n. Why? Started from the left. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm starting from the left, but why else would this be convenient? It doesn't really make a huge difference, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, but why don't I end at fn? Or then? It would end getting like another point over here. Each one of these is going for a length of 1 over n. And so I want the whole length to be all the way up to 1. If I had n plus 1 things, if I went 1 more, that would be a little bit too far. So if I give you another function g, not surprisingly, g of 0, dot, 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 g of n minus 1 over n. Well, I have two vectors. How do you tell if two vectors are perpendicular? Dot product is 0. <coughs> so, so f dot g should be like the sum of f of k over n, g of k over n, n goes from, I'm sorry, k goes from 0 to n minus 1. <coughs> so this is almost the notion of a dot product for functions. 
what I would want to do is I'd want to look at the limit as n goes to infinity. If I take the limit as n goes to infinity, what's the problem here? Well, it's not continuous. Oh, even if it's continuous. I mean, take the special case when f equals g equals 1. If f equals g equals 1, what is this going to be? It's going to go off to infinity. If f equals g equals 1, this is just n. So this does not have a nice limit as n goes to infinity. So what can I do to get a nice limit as n goes to infinity? Divide by, by, n. by n. Divide by n. Or multiply by 1 over n. Right? I once convinced one of my office mates that the golden mean had an incredible property. It was the reciprocal of its own inverse. And it took him a while before he realized what I had said and that he wanted to shoot me. If I put in the 1 over n, notice how nicely this fits things. I have n terms I'm dividing by n. This has a chance of having good convergence properties now. And as n goes to infinity, what is this going to look like? And the word was already said today. A Riemann sum. Right? There's only one thing we really have to do now. It is we want this to become g bar rather than g, the complex conjugate of g. And so we, we define the inner product like this, and then what we'll do is we take the limit as n goes to infinity. And other notation for this is the angular brackets. And the physicists you know, should like this notation. Right? It's very close to the bracket notation. So the question is, why do we put the absolute value of g? Well, let's take the vector 1i, and let's take its dot product with itself. What can you tell me about the dot product of a vector with itself? It's the length of the vector. So if I do this, I get 1 times 1 plus i times i. So what's 1 times 1 plus i times i? Zero. Great. We've just found a non-zero vector whose length is zero. Right, something is wrong. This is not the right notation, well, not the right definition for the length of a vector. We should not take its dot product with itself. We should take its dot product with its complex conjugate. So we have the complex conjugate of 1 and the complex conjugate of i. What's the complex conjugate of 1? 1. What's the complex conjugate of i? Minus i. And now you get 1 plus 1 is 2. And if you think about where this vector looks in the plane, here's 1, here's 1, this is the i-axis. I've got my right triangle, 1, 1, square root of 2. So the length of that vector should be square root of 2. This comes in as the square root of 2. So again, as we take the limit, this becomes the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x, g bar of x, dx. And that's the definition of the inner product. So again, we can define anything we want. This is a good definition. And so if you haven't seen a motivation before of why this is the right notion of an inner product, you know, hopefully this convinces you that this was a good decision. Okay. Any questions about the definition of an inner product? Could we do things on 0 infinity rather than on 0, 1? Yeah, we're mathematicians, we can do what we want. It's just, when is it useful, when will it converge, when will it make sense? Over here, for what f and g will this make sense? Well, if f and g are bounded, you know, continuous, you know, stuff like that, things are well behaved. You know, I need them to be nice functions. If I'm going off to infinity, however, now what do I need? It goes to zero infinity. It goes to zero infinity, and I need some idea of how rapidly it goes to zero. Uh, technically, what you said is false, unfortunately. So as a nice extra credit problem, give me a function which is non-negative, its integral is finite, but it does not go to infinity and infinity. Zero. I'm sorry? It doesn't go to zero. I'm sorry, it doesn't go to zero at infinity. Sorry, it does not go to zero at infinity. So find a function that integrates to one. You, know, you can always adjust by, if it's a finite integral, to make it integrate to one. It's non-negative, but it does not go to zero at infinity. So remember, real analysis can be painful. Okay? 
Just because your function is integrable does not mean it goes to zero at infinity. So I won't give a hint now. I'll let you think about it for a little bit as to how bad things might, might be able to be. So grid spaces of functions. How many of you have seen the notion of an LP space? Okay. So LP of an interval i is the set of all functions f such that the integral over i of f of x to the pth power is finite. So, how many of you have seen any duality relationships between LP and LQ spaces? What class was that? Measure theory. Measure theory? Okay. So, for the most part, there's three values of P that we tend to look at. And one of the P's doesn't exactly fit into this formalism. So, what are the big P's? One, two, and there's one more P that's special. Nope. Because if you put in zero, <laughs> it's just the length of i. Yeah. Infinity. Infinity! Excellent. So get another one. Yeah. You can have either one MMs, two MMs, or infinitely many MMs. But you cannot have any number other than one, two, or infinity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. So, <laughs> so the question is how do we define the L infinity norm? So basically, f infinity is the maximum or the supremum of the absolute value back. So later in the course, when we start doing some things in Fourier analysis, depending on the decay properties we have, we can prove different results. So which do you think has stronger decay at infinity, a function in L1 or a function in L2? So which decays faster at infinity, L1 or L2? L1. Why L1? Because if the integral is finite, yes. then the square of the integral should be finite too. Not, well, the square of the integral will be finite, but you want the integral of the square. So if everything in L1 should be in L2. At least going off to infinity. Because as you're going off to infinity, if you don't have enough decay, well, if you square it, your decay might actually be a little bit better. So in terms of decay, if my function is monotonically decreasing, if I square it, it's only going to decrease faster. So at infinity, it's much stronger to be in L1 than to be in L2. Okay. Now the other possibility is what if you're blowing up near the origin and you can try to figure out you know, which functions are integrable for x between say 0 and epsilon. And you can try to figure out the different inclusions between L1 and L2. One of the big things is you know, to look at a finite interval. So if you look at the interval 0, 1, is there a relationship between L1 and L2? So let's study L1 of 0, 1 versus L2 of 0, 1. <coughs> Which do you think is a stronger condition? To be in L1 or to be in L2? <coughs> so somebody give me a function that's not in L1. 1 over x. Okay. So, on, so we could take f of x equals 1 over x. It's not in L1 because if I integrate I get log of x. It's not in L2. Alright, so so far L1 and L2 are holding their own. So instead of 1 over x, what should I look at? So this wasn't an either. I want to find something that's in one but not the other. Let's try one over root x. That is an L1. If I integrate it, 
I get basically x to the one half over one half. But when I try to do its square, I get one over x that's not integrable. So we've just found a function that's in L1, but not in L2. So the question is, do you think L1 is larger than L2, equal to L2, or smaller than L2? You can eliminate one of the three. Right? Which one can you eliminate? I'm sorry? You can eliminate equal. What else can you eliminate? Um, I guess maybe it could be large. Maybe this function just happens not to be in it, but it has a lot more other functions. So do you think every function in L1 is in L2? We just, we just showed it wasn't. So, okay. So not everything in L1 is in L2. What about the other way? If you're in L2, are you in L1? So let's say f is in L2. So the integral from 0 to 1 of f squared dx is less than infinity. So we want to show the integral of absolute value of f is finite. I claim the absolute value of f is less than equal to the absolute value of f squared. Is that true? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, give me an example. If f takes on the value 2, 2 is less than 4. If f takes on the value 3, 3 is less than 9. Okay. Uh, half. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so if f is a half, a half is definitely not less than a half squared. What can I add to cover myself? I'm sorry? 1. Yeah, plus 1. That works. So you give me any f. If f is greater than 1 in absolute value, it's less than f squared. If it's less than 1 in absolute value, it's less than 1 in absolute value. And so now, the integral from 0 to 1 of the absolute value of f dx is less than equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of the absolute value of f squared dx plus the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 dx. Okay. And so this proves that L1 of 0, 1 is contained... I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. This contains... This proves that L2 is contained in L1. If you give me something that's L2, then it's also L1. And in fact, we know that they're not equal. So I can even go further like this. What was the key observation, or what allowed this proof to work? There are two things. The fact that the absolute value of f is less than equal to the absolute value of f squared. Okay, so the first was this kind of inequality. So if you haven't seen this before, you're breaking what you have into two situations. It's large, it's not large. So this is an extremely common technique in analysis. And again, one of the reasons why I want to do all this stuff is I want to review some of the things you've hopefully seen in analysis. Or if you haven't seen them, at least expose you to them. This is an extremely powerful trick. Okay, that was one observation. There was another observation. This would have been useless, except for the what fact. So what's very important on this line? If the uh, a resulting finite integral for that. Excellent. One over one, one it, part. It's a finite integral. Yeah. So if I, I was trying like, to, if I was trying to, if you extend the integral. As long as it's a finite integral, we're okay. But if we try to do it over all of R, this completely breaks down, and I can no longer use this argument. And now you know the relationship between L one and L two is very different. But on finite intervals, if L if you're in L2, then you're in L1. Yes? You could make a similar argument and just go forever, right? You like, could, but then this could be plus infinity. No, but I just mean like LP is always a strict oh, subset yes. of LP minus 1. Yes, yes. You can, you can absolutely prove stuff like that. Uh, for what we're doing, it's the L1 and L2 that are going to be most important, but absolutely. And there's relationships between the LP norm and the LQ norm. And it turns out it involves the reciprocals of the... Uh, uh, of those powers. Okay. Any question right now on inner products, orthogonalities, LP spaces? 
So now it's time to get to Fourier series. <coughs> so let's let en of x started with em of x. You know, let's figure out what is the dot product. Right? So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the nx, e to the mx, complex conjugate dx. So we get the integral from 0 to 1, e to the 2 pi i n x, e to the negative 2 pi i mx dx. So we get the integral from 0 to 1, e to the 2 pi i n minus mx dx. We've seen this integral numerous times over the semester. Right? What is this integral equal? So if n equals m, we're integrating the function 1. Okay, I can integrate the function 1 over an interval of length 1. That's not so bad. And what if m does not equal n? Zero. Zero. So what can we conclude about en and em? Orthonormal. Okay? So the set of the ENs, <coughs> and goes from minus infinity to infinity, are orthonormal. They all have length 1, and they're mutually perpendicular, mutually orthogonal. So the idea of Fourier analysis is just like in linear algebra, you expand a vector in terms of the directions, you expand a function in terms of the Fourier basis. And so you might call this the Fourier basis. Okay. So now the question becomes, if I give you a vector in you know, standard linear algebra, how do you find its component in the given direction? I'm going to risk asking you a linear algebra question. So I give you vector v, direction w. How do I find the amount of v in the direction of w? I'm sorry? So v dot w is a number. And so what would be its component in the direction of w? Times w hat. I have two different answers. I heard w hat and I heard w. What is w hat? The, the, unit, the vector. unit vector in the length of w. So the question is, when I do this, do I have to multiply by a unit vector? Should I have had a unit vector over here? Well, if I have a... If I have this, this is actually the same as v dot w hat in the direction of w, w hat is w divided by the length of w. Oh, sorry, w hat. So the question is, should this be a w hat or should this be a w? Who remembers their linear algebra? So one way is to just do a few examples and check. Another way is to redivide the theory. And there's another cheap cop-out that I really like. If B equals W. I'm sorry? If B equals W. Okay, well if, you take B equal, well, if you take B equals W, then you should just get back V. So this is a way to check and see what's going on. <coughs> yes! <laughs> By royal decree, <laughs> thou shalt never do anything other than with directions of unit length. Okay. Can I get an that? Wow! <laughs> Tom Brady, watch out! We've got this new, you know, passing receiver. <laughs> He's kind of fun. I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got it. Oh, come on. Oh, too far. You, you, you faked you out of me, really. You, you can't give up on the play. <laughs> you are scrambling for more time. One more time. <laughs> <laughs> so we declare all vectors for directions are unit vectors. 
This way you don't have to worry about any of these issues. How many of you have done formulas for like lengths of curves and you've got a parametrized curve and you're traveling around it? You might have done this in 106. And you've got formulas for the curvature and all these things and you have to remember, you know, when am I dividing by the speed squared? What do you do to make sure that you don't have to worry about that? Close. Set the speed equal to one. Right, you travel at constant speed, you know, uniform speed of speed one. So this is a really common idea to just make sure you don't forget factors, is just set the speed, set the vector to be one. Okay, well now that we're armed with this, we should try to figure out, you know, if I give you a function, what does it look like in the different Fourier directions? Given f, what is component in the direction of en? Right? En is a perfectly fine vector, and I can ask myself, how much of f do I have in that direction? So what I want to look at is I want to look at f dotted with en. And just to go back and forth between the two different notations, this time I'll use angular brackets. So if you have a preference, your preference will be hit half the time. Okay? So what is this going to be? It's going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. And we're going to define that number to be f hat of m. So we have a new function related to the original function. Okay. Our new function is defined where? So f was defined on all of 0, 1. Where is this function defined? I'm sorry? Where is this one defined? The function f hat is not defined necessarily on all of 0, 1. Right now, we've only defined this function on certain places. On the integers. So f hat is defined on the integers. Could we evaluate f hat at square root of n? Depends on n. Well, I mean, can I shove square root of n into this formula? Yeah. Yes. But I really don't know what e to the 2 pi i square root of 2x means. That's not one of my standard things. When I talk about an orthonormal system, I needed to have integers, and then I had n minus m, I had a complete number of cycles. If I put it in a rational number, all that would break down. Okay, so what about, let's take f minus f hat of n, en, and take its dot product with en. What do you think that should equal? Zero. Zero, why zero? Yeah, I basically throw away everything in the direction of EM and then see what's left over that's in the direction of EM. So I don't even have to do the calculation, right? Well, let's make sure things are consistent. So if we do this, it would be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x minus f hat of n e to the 2 pi i n x times e to the negative, I guess I don't need parentheses e to the negative 2 pi i and x dx. And the first term will be f of x times e to the negative 2 pi i and x. Oh, that's just f hat of n. The second one, I pull out the f hat of n, and I have e to the 2 pi i and x, e to the negative 2 pi i and x. Oh, good, that's just 1. And so, not surprisingly, we get 0. Okay, so as you would expect, if you subtract off your component in the direction of En, you are left with something that has no component in the direction of En. So for your series, we define Sn of x to be the sum, little n goes from minus n to n, of f hat of n, E and x. And if I were to look at f minus sn dotted with em, that will be 0 if the absolute value of m is less than n.
So, uh, one small comment about notation. If the function f is understood, it's clear that Sn is referring to the series, the Fourier series coming from f. If you have multiple functions that you care about, this is not the greatest notation. And so other notations you could use is you could use SNF to be your function name, or maybe even F sub n. Just so that you can clearly look down and see what's being studied. Okay. <coughs> so, do you think SN of x is a good approximation to F? And what would make it a damn good approximation to f? S infinity. Yeah, s infinity. So all we have to do is study s infinity of x is the sum, and goes from minus infinity to infinity, f hat of n e to the n x. And we'll get f minus s infinity dotted with e n is zero for all n. So what can we conclude? I'm sorry? Okay. Therefore, f equals s infinity. So who likes that conclusion? Okay, good. I was going to say, you know, you voted for it. You should at least... I, you are the lone man out. And just to really scare you, I also don't like the conclusion. So what are the issues with this? There are two issues. What could go wrong? Anybody can think of what could go wrong? It could be unbounded. What could be unbounded? Our sum had to diverge. Good. So the, the first issue could be maybe diverges, right? And if it diverges, then we have some issues. What else? The other one is trickier. It could be discontinuous at non-finitely many places. Well, maybe S, maybe S infinity is also discontinuous at finitely many places. For a series isn't a good approximation for piecewise function. Well, it's good, but it's like it's over I mean, that's something that will definitely arise when we look at what happens to specific functions. But there's something really big that we're missing. A big technical issue. Let's say you want to tell me where somebody, somebody, one of your friends, who has a friend who works in Manhattan? Ah. Who has somebody they know that works in Manhattan? Okay. Um, whose hand was up first? Who wants to talk about this? Okay. Where does your friend work? Uh, 42 and 7. Okay. 40 seconds. Okay. 42 and 7. Does that uniquely describe where this person is? No. Why not? Building! <laughs> Building tall! <laughs> right? Yes. What would we need to do to really figure out where your friend is? Where your friend works? It's not enough to say 42nd and 7th or whatever you said. We have to say what? Get the office. The office, the floor number. You forgot height! Okay. In Williamstown, if you forget height, is it a big deal? <laughs> I mean, okay, yes, I mean, Bronfman does have a couple of levels. You know, some of you have taken classes with me in the basement. We can have negative values for height. My office is on the second floor, goes up to the third floor. So maybe we have five values for height. In New York City, especially Manhattan, if you forget <coughs> height, is that a big deal? Yes. So the other issue here is completeness. Maybe we forgot some directions. So over here, the, I've removed every component of f in the direction of every en. But what if I forgot some directions? So for instance, what if I started the sum and goes from 0 to infinity, I just completely forgot about negative ends? Then the function would not be, the, the set would not be complete. So the big theorem is that this is a complete set of directions. We're not missing anything. 
Then the questions become, for which functions will the Fourier series in the end converge? And unfortunately, it will not converge for every function you want. Then the question becomes, well, how badly will it miss? And maybe I have a function that's continuous almost everywhere. Maybe it only has finitely many points of discontinuities. And the hope is that in a situation like that, I'll have good convergence. What we're going to see later is we're going to see one of my favorite themes in analysis, Fayer's theorem. And Fayer basically says, roughly screw Fourier, uh, let's look at weighted Fourier series. The weighted Fourier series converge a lot better than the Fourier series. So why would we ever use Fourier series rather than weighted Fourier series? Easier to work with. Easier to work with, right? You don't have to put in all these pesky weights. And so with the Fourier series, what happens is as you increase you have Sn of x is the sum and goes from minus n to n of f hat of n e n x. What's really nice is as you increase big N, you don't really change what you had in the middle. You just extend and add stuff on the ends. The weighted Fourier series, unfortunately, the weights are a function of big N, and the weights everywhere change. So it's a computation is a lot more work to deal with the weighted Fourier series. But it has much better convergence properties. And so we will see that the Fayer theorem is actually not that bad. There is a function f which is an L1 whose Fourier series diverges almost everywhere from it. Okay? So in terms of how bad things can go, you really can't do much worse than missing almost everywhere. Okay? So Fourier analysis can be very bad. It turns out if your function is an L2, the Fourier series converges almost everywhere. And this is a major result. Collison had a proof of this, I think, in the 1960s. My first year advisor at Princeton, Charlie Pfefferman, had another proof a few years later. Uh, this was back before I knew tech. I actually took notes in his class in Microsoft Word. Wow. Yes. But his proof was so descriptive, intuitive, geometric, that there weren't that many symbols. And even Microsoft Word kind of makes it look okay. Almost. <laughs> so we will see the different types of convergence issues. Okay, so what I want to do is, we've still got a couple of minutes, I want to get into approximations to the identity. How many of you have heard of approximations to the identity? Okay. So we're getting into new ground. <coughs> approximations to the identity. So I'll put the physicists on the spot. You're going to be on the spot a lot. What is often called a function but it's not a function? The Dirac delta function. It's really the Dirac delta functional. And so we decide this operator delta, the di Dirac delta functional. It's a map from functions to numbers, and it's defined as follows. The Dirac delta of some function f is just f of 0, and if I shift it by a, that's just f of a. So Dirac is one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century. Does anybody know where he ended up? I think he retired to a Florida institution. You know, in his career, he can go anywhere he wants. You know, go someplace where the weather is nice. So this is an operator. It takes a function as input and gives back a number. And so I'm going to define approximations to the Dirac delta functional. And so Consider um, gn of x is equal to, I won't bother to do things continuously. You can do things continuously if you want. This is just a little bit easier. Here's 0, here's minus 1 over n, here's plus 1 over n, and this is of height n. So actually, let's make this negative 1 over 2n. So what's the area under this curve? The area under this curve is 1. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity of gn of x dx is just 1. Let's assume f is continuous. And let's look at the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x times gn of x. Well, 
I really only have to integrate from minus 1 over 2n to 1 over 2n, because gn is 0 everywhere else. <coughs> and so this is minus 1 over 2n to 1 over 2n. And I'm going to write f of x as f of 0 plus small <coughs> times, and gn is just equal to n dx. Why can I write f of 0 as f of 0 plus small? If n is large. If n is large. So what allows me to then do this? It's a very, very small range. So it's a very small range. can't vary that much. Yeah, it's basically by continuity. For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta such that if x minus y is less than delta, then f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. Here my point x is going to be the point 0. And so I can choose whatever small epsilon I want. And as long as n is sufficiently large, I'll have this within my delta. Well, if I integrate this, f of 0 times n over an integral of length 1 over n is just going to give me f of 0. And then I'll have small times n over an integral of length 1 over n that will be small. So as n goes to infinity, what does this go to? f of 0. Uh, okay, the small will go to 0. And so the whole expression will go to f of 0. So <coughs> as n goes to infinity, we get f of 0. So this is the prototypical example of an approximation to the identity. Okay? It has a lot of nice properties. And so I'm going to codify the nice properties it has, and then I'll let you, you know, finish reading this in the book for the rest of the details. Now, what's a property that GN does not have that you might like it to have? Differentiability. differentiability that might be nice. <laughs> um, although, differentiability, you kind of hopped over something. Yeah, it might be nice to do. <laughs> might be nice for it to be continuous. Well, that's not a big deal. I can do a triangular function. And if I do a triangular function of height 2, I'm fine. But then I wouldn't be differentiable. Well, then I can stop playing games and smoothing it out. And to the, I'm sorry? Take a Gaussian. Take a Gaussian. In fact, that's what they do very frequently, is they take a Gaussian and they just adjust the variance of the Gaussian. And so an approximation to the identity so 1 it's non-negative 2 integrates to 1 so I will put the people who have taken uh, a class with me last year on the spot right now. What are you thinking? Probability. A probability distribution, right? It's non-negative, it integrates to 1. You'd be thinking, oh, it's a probability distribution. And then the last is the following. And so this is going to be a family of functions gn. Um, for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists an n such that for all n greater than n, the integral over the absolute value of x uh, there, exists an, there exists an n and there exists a delta such that delta greater than 0, there exists an n such that for all n greater than n, the integral of gn of x dx is less than epsilon. Okay? And so what I'm doing is I'm saying I stay a little bit away from the origin. And then if n is sufficiently large, I can make this probability as small as I want. So essentially, in the limit, all the mass is concentrated at the origin. If you want to think of this as a point mass, okay, it's, if you think of it as a point mass, you know, here's the origin, it's plus infinity over here, which is a little high, and it's zero everywhere else. It has mass one. So in this case, infinity 
the height times zero, the length equals one. Okay? Infinity times zero equals one. Okay? That's the correct interpretation for what we're doing here. Is that a physics result? No. Um, <laughs> physics would be. <laughs> or maybe that's engineering. Yeah, we just say it's equal to one. Oh, you say it's equal to one? Okay. Or would you have like infinity over 2 pi maybe? Or... <laughs> be so, one two pi. <laughs> so basically, instead of doing this for the triangle function or the square function, you could do this for any probability distribution as was suggested. A Gaussian is a great choice. That's definitely worth the minimum. <laughs> nice! Oh, <laughs> one hand. Nice. I wasn't even expecting that. Well, you know, but neither was Pat. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you can plug in anything you want for GN as long as it satisfies this. A Gaussian is just very technically easy to work with. Now, the difficulty with the Gaussian is it goes off to infinity. Alright, so, you know, read the stuff in my notes, especially on the stuff on approximation to identities. On Monday, we will prove Fourier's theorem. And from Fourier's theorem, we will prove Weierstrass's theorem. And we will also see why Fourier analysis is much harder. It's going to come down to what is an approximation to uh, Fourier's theorem. F E J E R. And there's an axiom mark over one of the E's.